I'll mm-hmm. begin by asking you to give us your name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, just tell us your full name, Father. I am Jim Reuter of the Society of Jesus. Arthur Francis Shay. Bill Kreutz. Edmundo Martinez. Francis X. Clark. John Krebs. Luigi Moji. Out there, Andrew Bauer. Miguel Anselmo Bernat. My name is uh, Honesto. My middle name is Chavez. And his name is Pagana. I'm Roque Angel Ferios Tijamias. Bishop, maybe we can begin by just getting some personal background about you, like mm-hmm. your full name, uh, yeah. when did you enter the society, and when were you installed Bishop here? So I am from Cagayan de Oro. My name is uh, Honesto. My f- middle name is Chavez, and last name Pacana. Uh, my grandparents and my great-grandparents came from Cagayan de Oro. And I, was, I entered the society in 1951, that was June 1951. And then I was ordained in 1965, and then came back after ordination, came back and I was assigned here in Bukidnon since 1969 up to 1991. At that time I was assigned uh, to the seminary as rector of St. Jean Vianney, and then in 1994 I was ordained bishop of uh, Bukidnon or the Diocese of Malay Balay. So up until I've been a bishop for uh, five years now, going on six. Uh-uh. Uh, bishop, perhaps you can give us some kind of background on the history of the Jesuits' work here in Mindanao, and particularly here in Bukidnon, just some of the highlights that you remember. So I guess after the restoration, if I recall, in, 19, uh, in 1870 uh, or 1876, around that time that the Jesuits took over, uh, the mission here in Mindanao from the uh, Recoletos. And then after the revolution, uh, American Revolution, the, United, uh, the American Jesuits took over from the Spanish Jesuits. And little by little, they began to establish missions here in uh, Bukidnon from Hasaan, which is a town in Misamis Oriental. And uh, Mindanao was uh, divided into four uh, sections. One, the western part was under Haro, the eastern part under Cebu, and then the southern and the northern under Sambuanga and Cagayan uh, de Misamis. Or Misamis, Cagayan de Misamis, now Cagayan de Oro, uh, under Archbishop Hayes. And then after the war, uh, the Jesuits moved in from Cagayan de Oro. This was still part of Gagayan de Oro, and um, among the outstanding Jesuits here was Father Coley, who established about 12 missions at the time. Up until 1969, uh, uh, when this became, uh, 1969 April, when this became a prelature, a separate, um, a separate uh, ecclesiastical district. And the first bishop then was uh, Bishop Claver at the time, yes. Um, if you recall, he was followed by uh, Arch. Uh, Bishop, Bishop, what, what, in your opinion, uh, have been some of the key contributions of the Jesuits here in Mindanao and specifically here in Bukidnon? Uh, among them, of course, was the establishment of the different parishes. Um, at the time when this became a prelature, uh, the majority of the priests here, in fact, all of the priests except one, were Jesuits, about 35 of them. 15 of them were Filipinos, and the rest were Americans, French, uh, uh, Italians. 
So the uh, the, the bigger uh, the biggest contribution uh, that the uh, Jesuits had here was the establishment of the different parishes and mission stations. Um, so those are the main ones, you know. And they continued up until even up to this time. The Jesuits who are conti uh, who are working here uh, continued the same uh, thing that the uh, forebears had done, you know. But when, when we look at Bukidnon today, the local church today, there are fewer Jesuit parish priests. Uh, what can you say about this uh, state of affairs right now? I think this is a very good development because uh, um, if you recall, or at that time when Bishop Clabe became the first uh, bishop here, the, uh, the priority he, uh, that he gave, he gave the priority rather to uh, the formation of priests to the uh, formation of seminarians. That was his priority here. And since then we have, since 1969, up to now we have um, uh, 50 diocesan priests. 50 diocesan priests. So from 1999 only one. And that one was fa Bishop, uh, was Father Mangiran and now Bishop of uh, Bishop Mangiran of the Polog. So there has been a lot of growth uh, in the number, uh, growth in vocations and uh, more and more ordinations every year. So this is a good development because I think this, um, in a way, when the, Jes when the diocesan uh, priests take over, this is really in line with the tradition of uh, the society, that once the parishes are established, they are given over to the diocesan clergy. And I think this is a, a, a very good, uh, you know, a very good indication of uh, in, uh, what, what, how, how the church is growing and uh, in what, the, uh, what direction it is taking, you know. Bishop, in, with regard to the local church in Bukidnon or even in Mindanao, how would you distinguish the church here uh, compared to, let's say, the church in the rest of the country, for example, in Metro Manila? Would, would there be some distinguishing factors about the local church in Mindanao and particularly in Bukidnon? I think here in Mindanao, and particularly here in Bukidnon, um, the, the church is uh, rather young because uh, many of the people who have come here are really from uh, Luzon and the Visayas. Uh, they migrated to this place and uh, it is a kind of a melting pot. And, and because of that, uh, you find that the, the liturgies, for example, are much more alive and people are much more participative. Another thing uh, that is outstanding perhaps here in Bukidnon is the uh, proliferation of the BECs, a lot of BECs. And uh, uh, perhaps this, I, I would say that this is the main factor that contributed, that has contributed to the, uh, the growth of the church and the growth of faith. The, uh, something about the BEC, just so that the viewers who don't know much about it can have a brief introduction. Bishop, you mentioned that one of the key characteristics and factors here was the BEC. Yeah. Perhaps you can say a little bit about the BEC. Well, um, uh, briefly, BEC is uh, a kind of uh, a movement. Sometimes people don't call it a movement, but because some people would say it is a way of being church. Okay let it be uh, a way of being church. We are trying to bring the church, which for many people is too big and too, uh, you know, invisible, we might say, to bring it to their level. And so we try uh, to train our people how to group themselves to come together regularly in order to reflect on the Word of God. Now, at that level, So, Bishop, uh, you mentioned that BEC is a way of being church, so mm. we're bringing the church down to the level of the people. Yes. A um, this is one way to uh, make the people more participative, because at that level, the people feel more at home. Whereas, if there were no small groups we call BEC, Sometimes the people's participation is very impersonal in church and, and uh, they don't develop as much or as fast as uh, they do in small uh, Christian communities. 
So the BEC is an attempt to bring the church and all the, uh, we might say, the uh, blessings that come with being members of the church at the level at the level of the grassroots or sometimes we say at the level of the unchurched. So uh, those small communities now are proliferating all over Bukidnon. And this is one, as, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why we have uh, the church is much more alive. And um, it is easier to mobilize people because of this uh, strong, um, <clears throat> strong, uh, vibrant uh, communities, the presence of these. Um, Bishop, one of the criticisms of uh, the work of the Jesuits here in Mindanao in the past has been a sort of concentration more on the Dumagats, which is meant for the vehicle. Actually, uh, the way I look at it is uh, because that was the need at the time, so they answered the need, you know. However, there were Jesuits who were already involved, one of the outstanding Jesuits, Father Cullen who was the only probably non-Filipino who could speak Binokid very well. And he was the, uh, the, uh, the one in charge of the indigenous peoples at that time, you know, when I came here in 1969. And even before that, he was here for about 60, uh, 27 years working among the tribals. But most of our priests were answering just the need of, at that time, was establishment of uh, parishes and uh, servicing the people in that parish and for lack of uh, for lack of personnel also uh, their time was very much was very much uh, <clears throat> spent on uh, parish and the parishioners there and most of them are the dumagats so that's not necessarily a bad thing that was the need of the time no but now that we have more and more personnel, more and more uh, diocesan priests to take over, so the Jesuits will take uh, in, uh, along the line or in the spirit of Ignatius, uh, taking the apostolates that are, we might say, less popular, less attractive, and uh, which probably uh, diocesan priests would not choose. So like, for example, um, for example, the work in Kabanglasan, or the work before of Father Leone, and now, continued by Father Matt Sanchez, uh, <clears throat> they gave a lot of time to the uh, tribals. So, and there are also, I would ask some of our diocesan priests are also involved with it. So that criticism was, it is true that uh, I guess the Jesuits in the past uh, concentrated on the Dumagats, but that was uh, what was needed at the time. Uh, Bishop, perhaps you can say a little story or two about Father Cullen, if there are any well, one of the things that uh, first of all I remember that the song, the song that was uh, probably his favorite because I often heard him uh, hum this song is uh, "Here I am, Lord, uh, I am ready to serve your people." If I recall, those those are among the lines there. So I think he was singing this in relation to his work, no. But among his uh, perhaps outstanding qualities is he was really a person who uh, tried to help the people help themselves. So one time he made a remark, he said, if I die, I am not going to leave behind some monuments. I have not built any school, I have not built any uh, seminar house, anything to my name, but I have built people, as much as to say, you know. So he was outstanding in that. So that uh, people who followed in his footsteps are, uh, do not have any difficulty, you know. He tried to, first of all, educate the people into, uh, um, educate them so that they'd be able to help themselves. Well, the traditional, if you uh, know, the traditional approach of the missionary has been uh, that tendency to, to give to dole out, no? but that was a kind of um, perhaps the need of the moment. But Father Cullen, even in, her earlier, in his uh, earlier years, saw that this was, not, uh, this was not the way. And the other thing was, uh, he was a hardy man in the sense that, you know, um, he was hard on himself and he was also, uh, he, he demanded a lot uh, the people. 
So he was that kind. And uh, many people, the older ones in, uh, for example, over here in uh, Kolabugao, remember him for his dedication and for what they learned from him. No, uh, they you might say he did not spoil them at all. You know, so they're much more, you say, mature, much more mature in their uh, practice of faith. Bishop, you mentioned earlier that during the time of uh, Bishop Claver, his one of his priorities was the formation of priests. Yeah. Would this remain as one of your, one of your priorities right now during your? Yeah, actually, I continue the same. At the time, actually, during his time, is formation of seminarians. So, start a seminary and the formation of seminarians. There are no priests yet, no? But for me now, uh, I have also to concentrate on the ongoing formation of priests, not just the formation of seminarians. So, right now, we have about 70 seminarians and we have about 50 diocesan priests. So I give the priority to the formation of both now. At the time of Bishop Claver, only the seminary. Because he was just starting. But now more and more, my time and energy and uh, uh, money spent on um, uh, the formation of priests. You know. uh, Bishop, with regard to the church here in Bukidnon, the Dice of Bukidnon, uh, what, what would be the, uh, some of the challenges that you, that you face here in Malaybalay? At the moment, um, what we are facing at the, the moment is the, uh, to, to help our tribal communities. That's one. The other is to uh, help um, protect our environment, our forest. You know? So those are the two. Now, in terms of helping our tribals, our, uh, the tribal communities, um, whatever we can do to help either to um, help them li uh, by, uh, by uh, advocating for, for them, you know, uh, bringing their cause to the higher authorities, help, helping them uh, economically, we do that. There are, for example, here in Quezon, uh, some Manobos who are dislocated. So we are trying to help them by mobilizing some NGOs. We are trying to get legal help for them. Because although they have received their, uh, the, um, what you call CADSI, uh, that is the, uh, the, uh, that is the uh, permit they have to occupy this land, which, is, which belongs to them as an ancestral domain, nevertheless they cannot enter because they're up against uh, very powerful people, very powerful management. So we're trying to help them by enlisting the help of some lawyers at this time. So they are there uh, putting up small uh, tents along the road in Quezon, awaiting, awaiting the decision of the uh, higher court on them. No? And over here also the Mapalad farmers, they just lost the case. So we were trying to help them and now we are trying to console them that actually even though uh, they may have lost uh, from the legal point of view, but they should not consider the whole thing as total failure because they succeeded in awakening the uh, conscience and awareness of the nation to more to related problems and larger problems, you know. And then we have another, we are trying to help these people occupy again a certain portion of land owned by a uh, titled under uh, a very powerful uh, family here and they cannot enter because they are prevented by their armed armed guards. And yet, legally, they should. It's already theirs because it is uh, identified as an ancestral domain. And yet, they cannot enter. The problem is they are being, their, their, their request or their um, demands are being uh, just passed from one office to another, passed on from one office to another. And that has been the uh, kind of the problem here too much bureaucracy and all that, you know. So this is what we are doing for our tribals here in Bukidnon. Uh, what about so, with regard to the environment, Bishop? You mentioned that. Yeah, the environment, if um, you recall, maybe um, a way, way back in the 80s that uh, there was this, um, uh, the San Fernando people, the parish, parishioners of San Fernando stopped the logging trucks from coming out from, uh, and they barricaded the road bodily. 
and they brought their uh, cause to Manila and they even staged a hunger strike there no until again the nation's uh, conscience was uh, awakened and all that finally the government perhaps uh, hesitantly but uh, anyway uh, to, uh, declared total log ban here in Bukidnon because of that and now we are we have one parish that is uh, in Wao that belongs to the uh, autonomous region and yet it belongs to us that parish so the people there also are staging a blockade of uh, the transport of the, the transport uh, transport of logs out of uh, the autonomous region uh, into Bukidnon. So that's what they are doing there also uh, right now and the whole diocese is helping them. Uh, they are supporting them in every way. Yeah. Bishop, my, maybe my final question is, as, a, as both be, uh, being both a bishop and a Jesuit, you enjoy a special perspective you know, as to knowing the needs of the local church as well as knowing what the, I suppose the Jesuits can, can do. No? Mm -hmm. So as, a, as the bishop of this place, what do you think is the service that the Jesuits can provide here? What do you think would be something that would, be a, would constitute a real contribution to the local church? Yes, the main contribution I can see uh, that the Jesuits have, I mentioned already to um, uh, some extent, is that they are ready uh, to take on the ministry that uh, probably, as I said, less popular and less uh, attractive, you know. And um, we might say the frontier ministry, you know, like for example, Mayor, Mayor Rayun or Sambuangita. Those are examples of frontier ministries. And the other thing that uh, the Jesuits could, I could see, can contribute a lot is in the realm of the spiritual. You know, especially the, for the, um, uh, they can be very uh, inst uh, effective instruments for the renewal of our different communities, you know. Uh, due to the background, due to their background, like if they could concentrate on helping the people how to pray, how to discern, because sometimes that is lacking, especially when, when you are confronted with some kind of issues and people must learn how to discern what, what course of action should we take. The other is the Jesuits are identified more with, perhaps uh, we say, identified more with the poor. And I think, uh, by and large, they take seriously the uh, option for the poor thrust of the society, you know, or of the church, for that matter. So I think uh, those are the uh, contributions of the... Of the and, uh, of course, the fact that we lack priests. Just uh, for them to take, to take some of the parishes, that's a big contribution already, you know. Bishop, one of the things that the provincial right now is uh, proposing is that, uh, that, that the judge should pull out of the parishes, not the rural parishes, except for those which serve the tribal minorities. Would you say this is something that you would agree with? Uh, it seems to me that before uh, uh, provincial would do that, maybe he might want first to talk to the bishop, to the local ordinary. Because if it is really the society is here to answer a need, the need may not be necessarily uh, the tribal uh, the work for the tribal. I think the local bishop will have to help identify that need that uh, cannot be answered by our diocesan clergy for, uh, for lack of personnel. No? So I think that is one. In other words, I hope that the bishop will also be part, uh, be partner of determining what is the need of the diocese and where can the, because if uh, you say the society is all things to all men, all things to all work, uh, maybe you say okay, tribal or continue, but we have other needs. How about it? You know, we have other needs. Supposing, supposing now I say we have some, we need somebody to run the radio station. Let us just suppose. But if the society will say, well, we determine what, what work we do in Bukidnon, so it will not answer, it really doesn't, the, the society does not, uh, is not available in that sense, no? Because it chooses its own, its own area of work. But if we say, Bishop, we are here uh, at your service, in what way can we help? That would be, that, that kind of approach I, I prefer than for the society just to determine, because 
the bishop knows uh, what the needs are and I do not have priests for this, I do not have priests for that. So I would think that is... Uh, bishop, do you have anything else you want to add? I'd more or less have asked all the questions. Uh, I would want that in the future, for example, that the society or the Jesuits will continue to support the mission and vision of the diocese. Uh, for example, integral evangelization, that's one. BEC, that's another. Uh, intensify that. And then um, what we call community of disciples, discipleship, intensification of the spirituality of the people. That is very important for us because uh, during the period of martial law, uh, our people were so involved in act, uh, you know, um, uh, activism, we might say, in justice issues, that it is about time, at that time we felt that it was after martial law, it's good for them to pull back and to attend to their interior life, you know. I would like that to, con to, to be continue the discipleship. And then the third is commitment to people. And commitment to people here means working for justice and option for the poor. This is the, this is the mission vision of, uh, these are the, uh, you know, elements in the mission vision of the diocese. And I'd like the Jesuits or the society to support that. But uh, another thing in which I think the Jesuits could, 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 uh, whose, uh, uh, the Jesuits' presence could be more felt would be in connection with our Presbyterium. Uh, the way I look at it, it is very good the Jesuits are working in the different parties, no problem. But when we have a Presbyterium, hardly do you see any Jesuit, you know, in our Presbyterium. That I hope, although it's not really required because they are not diocesan priests, but they are, they are invited, you know. Because there they would know more about our work, about the diocesan priests, their weaknesses, their strengths, and all that. And we have a common objective. So that when there is some kind of uh, a common stand, uh, they would not be left out. Or there is a mobilization, they would not be left out. And if there is something that the bishop would want the whole church to, uh, to let us say, to consider, they would not be left out. But all these things are discussed in the presbyteral meeting. You know, so I would want the Jesuits to be in that area to be much more involved with the clergy, not just in matters of knowing them who they are, but in terms of uh, joining presbyteral activities, even our recollection, you know. It has been sad or, uh, some, something like it has been the custom that, you know, you invite Jesuits to give uh, recollection to the diocesan clergy. What we have initiated is uh, they identify the people among themselves to give the recollection. It would have been nice if Jesuits were there to attend also, you know. Uh, 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 that's the, about the only thing that I expect. You know? Thank you very much. Bishop. Okay, very good. Uh -huh.